Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the eighth day of November in the year of our Lord, 2023. Um, we're going to dive into a little historical context, and I would like to explain why I believe that the, uh, the Zionist project has been a failure and will must necessarily be a failure. Uh, it is. It will be another disaster for the Jewish people. And before I get there, you know, sometimes I am looking for a certain thing on the internet. In this case, I was looking for a little bit of a refresher on the Bar Kokhba rebe uh, rebellion of the Jewish rabbinical pharisaical sect. I shouldn't say pharisaical. That has a, a different connotation. The sect of the Pharisees uh, that led uh, the Jewish people into absolute destruction again in 132 AD, 132 to 136. The leader of that uh, um, insurrection, that rebellion, was a man called Simon Bar Kokhba. And so I was looking for, to refresh my memory on that. He, it turns out he also, during that period, because Christians, the other Jewish sect in the land, refused to join him in his rebellion against the Romans, probably because they were following the teachings of Jesus. Thou sh he that takes up the sword shall perish by the sword. Yes. Uh, so, um, and because of that, he persecuted them, even killing them because they refused to join him in his war on Rome. And, well, he came to be known as a false messiah because he led Israel to destruction. So anyway, I was looking at this, and I saw a picture on the uh, Wikipedia website that was uh, referred to Bar Kokhba, an image of him, <laughs> an image, a Jewish image of him, and where did, where did that lead me to? Where was that image located at? A, memo a memorial to Bar Kokhba, of all people. Well, guess where it is? It is located on the, uh, the, uh, this right here. Let me see. Can I bring that up larger? Yes, this is the, the, the Knesset menorah. This is, so the Knesset is the is the uh, um, governing body, the the parliament. It's a parliamentary system. It's a, the parliament of the Jewish state, of the Zionist state. Uh, it's not really the Jewish state. It's, it's a Zionist state because it doesn't represent all of the Jews in the world at all. But it's on one of the branches of the menorah here. And he's uh, and so this is this is a place of honor, but the central branch. It, so sometimes you follow these trails and you find out some interesting and relevant information. On the central branch, let me see if I can go back here. There is, let's see, where is it located? Oh, this was was actually uh, created by a a Jewish man living in England, I believe. It's bronze. It is uh, weighs four tons. It's four point three meters high and three point five meters wide. Um, and the Knesset's located in Jerusalem. I've never been in it, but I've seen it from a distance. I don't think they allow people like me to go near things like that. Well, I don't think they let me in the country anymore. Not that I want to go there. I've been there. I've seen there. I, Jesus wasn't there. <laughs> there is a new Jerusalem that will be much better. But since he's coming back to Jerusalem, we'll be with him. I'll be with him. So. Uh, so this was, why did they pick, oh, this guy's crazy, this Benno Elkin, a Jewish maker of images. Isn't there a little inconsistency there? Obviously, he's not Orthodox. But the menorah, of course, was the seven-branched gold candlestick. Isn't that, um, so, so the, 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 the candlestick or the candlestick, is it the lamp, 
the seven branch lamp, the menorah in the temple was to be made out of solid gold or formed out of gold. And it was fueled by olive oil. Uh, and it was, you know, the uh, Hanukkah is the festival of lights was really um, in the inter intertestamental period. It had to do with with uh, the cleansing of the temple and the relighting of the menorah. And the, according to legend, they didn't have enough oil to keep it going, but it just kept burning miraculously until they could get the oil for it. So that's uh, that's what Hanukkah is about, which is around the time of Christian's Christmas, which probably is not when Jesus was born. But... You know the the early uh, well the the institutional. I, I there really isn't a good record of when it began, but by the time of Constantine, we're going to talk about Constantine a little bit, and how it's related to Zionism. It it's the, the context, uh, but uh, yeah, it's 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 ironic that they have Bar Kokhba memorial, uh, memorialized on the uh, on the menorah of the Knesset, the rebel that led Israel to destruction. <sighs> one of more than one. You know, it's interesting because Jesus said um, that the Jews, that w they would not follow him. They would not believe on him, but he said, uh, I have come in my Father's name, and you did not receive me, but another will come in his own name, and him you shall receive. A prophecy that they would follow a false messiah. And Bar Kokhba was a false messiah. Uh, 70 AD was bad, and then 132 to 136, it, same kind of stuff. They were forbidden to even come to Jerusalem, except for the Av... What was the name? The, the the Jewish holiday that that's or it's not a holiday, a day of mourning that's in memory of the destruction of the temple, both uh, uh, the Babylonian destruction and the Roman destruction, and the ninth of Ab. They both occurred on the same day of the same month, both destructions. So the the Romans would let Jews come to Jerusalem on that day and that day alone after. The disaster of, I'm going to say 135, because that's when, when Bar Kokhba himself was killed. But on the central column of the menorah, there's something else that's relevant to today. And let's go down to the, oh, I didn't, did I actually show you? There, there. So Bar Kokhba is on one of these here. Uh, that here, here he is right here. This is Bar Kokhba's. So he's right near the center. But on the center one, it's like the the his the history of Israel. What did they get? One, two, three, four, seven. <laughs> the seven dispensations of Israel. <laughs> That's a bit of a private joke there. Um, dispensationalists would understand what I meant by that, but I'm not a dispensationalist. Hmm. But the, the central column, the center lap, uh, lamp, central, okay, right here. Okay, so like I said, sometimes you find things that you weren't looking for, but they're relevant. Uh, the central branch here is what? The war with the Amalekites. The war with the Amalekites. What did Netanyahu bring up the other day? Amalek. Now, I was rather surprised by that because I don't think Netanyahu is a, is a man of the scriptures. But this is outside the Knesset on, this, on the menorah there. Amalek, so it's always in their consciousness. You can thank the Brits for that. 1956, that was another disaster for the for Israel, too. That's when Israel conspired with England and the French to seize the Suez Canal. And it was a conspiracy. In, uh, Israel launched an attack 
into the Sinai. And then the Egyptians responded, and the French and the British used that as part of the conspiracy as an excuse to land forces and seize the canal. And who put a stop to that? Eisenhower. Eisenhower said, no, you don't. He, he made some phone calls, and he terminated it. He terminated it. No, you don't. And they also wanted to get Nasser. They wanted to get rid of Nasser. And Eisenhower stopped it. And Biden could if he was a man of character at all, but he's not. He is not an Eisenhower, not even a, not even a Nixon. No, he's, he's just a got jelly, a man of jello. Just, I mean, he's a politician. All his whole life in politics. That has to warp a person badly. But then, I mean, his personal character, he does not have personal character. He's, uh, he's got a history of, of, you know, he's, his wife, he committed adultery with her, uh, married a man, um, another man's wife is what he did. And is that a, me a measure of character right there? And his history of lying, plagiarism, everything else going way back. And yet, he was elected. Yikes. Bad choices, Trump or Biden. Looks like it's going to be that again. So on the center column, what do they have here? Um, uh, the independence war with, let's, let's start at the top, I guess. Uh, the center branch, the war with the Amal uh, Amalekites, the war with Amalek is at the top of it. Central, uh, what Elkon, uh, the center branch displays the events, characters, and idioms Elkon saw as most central to the history of Israel. The war with the Amalekites? Really? So this guy put, puts it in the consciousness of Israel, of the state of Israel on the menorah, at the Knesset. This is where Netanyahu got the idea. He is not a man of Scripture. It's not. No, it's in the Scriptures, in chapter 17 of Exodus. But, and we'll look at that, but th this is central to this, his idea of this. And I want to look at the actual Scriptures because, of course, the people at Wikipedia do not care about the context. So let's go over to the scriptures here, because context is important. So let's start at a little bit before verse 8 in chapter 17. And as usual, what do we find? The people of Israel whining and complaining against God. In verse 2, Therefore the people contended with Moses and said, Give us water that we may drink. And Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? Now, this is the period, this whole 40 years in the wilderness, and the reason it was 40 years, it doesn't take 40 years to cross the Sinai from Egypt to Canaan? No. No, God uh, condemned them to, to wander in the wilderness for 40 years until the entire generation that came out of Egypt, in other words, all the, the adults that left Egypt following Moses died in the wilderness, except two. And neither one of those two was Moses. They were uh, Caleb, and Joshua, and God has a way of writing things in there. So this is also a, a uh, what's the word, an allegory, a biblical allegory that God has written in history. Moses was able to deliver them out of Egypt, out of bondage into the wilderness, delivering them from paganism 
uh, to the worship, to being the, uh, the people of God, but not into the promise of God. So they were following Moses, not actually following God. They were following Moses in the wilderness. Uh, they didn't, they wanted, didn't really want to have anything to do with God. Uh, he was a bit scary, uh, especially at the Mount Sinai, and deliberately so. Uh, and the law, I mean, they, I mean, there was this period that they, 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 were, they did not have the heart to follow God. They wanted to go back to Egypt. They loved the food of Egypt. They, they didn't like wandering in the wilderness. But they, God condemned them to, uh, to wander for 40 years until that generation was consumed because they did not believe him, except for two, C Caleb and, and uh, Joshua. Not even Moses was uh, not permitted because he had uh, disobeyed God. He struck the rock when he was told to speak to the rock in his anger, and that prevented him from entering into God's promise, the promised land. But the interesting is, who led them into the promised land? Joshua. So Moses couldn't brought them out of Egypt, but he couldn't bring them in. He brought them out of the world, out of bondage, but he could not bring them into Canaan, into the promised land. Joshua could, did. Well, this, this is a New Testament type. Moses is the law. He brought the law. Joshua who brought them to the land of promise is the same name as Jesus, Yeshua. Exactly the same name written in the scriptures. Admittedly, it's a, uh, um, an allegory or metaphor, but it is one God wrote into history. There's a reason for that. So... So here, it starts out in the context of, of the people grumbling and complaining. Give us water, give us water, that we may drink. Uh, they're, they're complaining. God, in, in the wilderness, God did not like the complaints. You know, rather than giving thanks to God for what he did for them, they were grumbling. They weren't trusting him. They did not trust him, though his presence was was visibly there in, in the cloud by day and the fire by night, leading them always and then providing them with water and providing them with manna. And they grumbled about it. They, they got to the point they despised the manna. They wanted the stuff of Egypt. They wanted the garlic and the, and the leeks and the, and the fish and the, and the meat. Flesh. Well, I don't think the Egyptians ate much of that, really. The beer. They had a lot of beer in Egypt. They would take, they would bake bread and then ferment the bread in water to make beer out of it. Beer was a big thing. That was a staple of the diet in Egypt. So the, it goes on here. And this is a context for verse 8 here, for Amalek. And the people thirsted there for water, and the people complained against Moses and said, Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So Moses cried to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And Moses, And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people and take with you some of the elders of Israel and also take in your hand your rod which, which, uh, with which you struck the river um, when Moses struck the river and it turned into blood, the Nile, and go. And behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock and water shall come out of it and that the people may drink." And Moses did so in the sight of the elders of Israel. So he called the name of the place Ma uh, Massa and Meribah because of the contention of the children of Israel. <laughs> Named it after their, their contention with God, complaints, place of complaint, that the people may drink, um, uh, because they had tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? 
See, they, they could not enter into Canaan because they didn't trust God. They did not trust him. They never trusted him. That whole generation could never come to trust him, except for Moses and Caleb. Even Moses, or Moses, uh, Caleb and, and Joshua, uh, even Moses was not faithful. See, Moses, Moses brought the law, and the law only gives life to those who obey it completely. So Moses, the way of Moses was a way of obedience. It wasn't the way of faith. And when Moses struck the rock in disobedience, in another instance of this, to, to bring water out, God told him to speak to the rock. He didn't speak to the rock. He struck it instead in anger. And because he did that, because the law requires perfect obedience, and God said, this is what you're supposed to do, and he didn't do it, therefore he could not enter into the promised land. He died in the wilderness. See, God has written the gospel into history in the right way and the wrong way, and the law does not bring you life, it brings you death. But Joshua and Caleb, they trusted in God. They believed God. They continued to believe God. They trusted in him, not in their, in their obedience, not in their, in their selves. So in that context, we go on to verse 7. So he called, the uh, well, Massa and Meribah, now verse 8. Now Amalek came and fought with Israel and, and uh, Rephidim in the place of contention. So Amalek, a, a pagan nation, a pagan tribe comes up. These weren't large nations then. And Moses said to Joshua, choose us some men and go out to uh, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses said unto him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And so it was when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. So he was up there with the rod. Holy night. When he held up his hand, the battle went in favor of Israel. When his hand fell down, <laughs> oh, I'm getting tired. Try that sometime. See how long you can hold your hand up. Um, can you do it all day? No. Amalek prevailed when he let down his hand. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. And Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the, uh, the other on the other, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua defeated Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this for a memorial in the book and recount it in the hearing of Joshua, I will utterly blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called its name, The Lord is My Banner. Um, it's traditionally, in Christians refer to it as Jehovah Nis Nissi. Uh, Jehovah is a corruption, but it's, it would be like Yahweh Nissi. The Lord, that's the YHWH, the I am that I am, is my banner. For he said, because the Lord has sworn, the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. So Amalek became a symbol as is uh, imaged on the uh, menorah of, uh, if you read the description there, of uh, the idea that in every generation adversaries would arise against Israel and they would have to fight against these adversaries. So it's not a straight understanding of the biblical context. But it's, uh, I'm sure Netanyahu's idea comes from the menorah far more than it comes from Exodus. Little side issue there. Now, and that only took 25 minutes. Sorry about that. I don't realize how long these little diversions take sometimes. So, 
there was times when I was working as an engineer or personally in other things where you have an idea or somebody wants you to do something, <laughs> requests you to do something, and you think about it and, and sometimes you have to think about how can I do this, how can I accomplish this, and sometimes it turns out to be a dead end and you have to say, it can't be done. I just can't do it. It's not possible. And it disappoints people, but you have to come and realize that fact. Um, it's, I'm, I can think of several examples that's currently going on in the world. You know, like uh, the, the Ukraine, when they decided to make war on Russia. Well, that wasn't, a, they, well, they led themselves into that. America led them into that. That was the American plan to use Ukraine to wage war on Russia indirectly. Of course, it results necessarily in the destruction of Ukraine. The idea that Ukraine could defeat Russia is pretty absurd. It's just how, even even with all of NATO's weapons that are now gone. See, this is rather interesting, too. Um, I was thinking yesterday, what is Nasrallah doing? Delaying? Well, I think he's waiting for for the, the, the remaining weapons of NATO to be exhausted in the Gaza, and then he'll decide what he's going to do. He, he doesn't really care about the Palestinians. That's not his issue. Nasrallah's in Lebanon. He's got projects there. He's, not, he's never acted, that I can see in history, really in the defense of the Palestinians. More often, they were a problem, like the PLO when they were in Lebanon. Um, the PLO is not, and then there's the Shia Sunni thing too. Yeah, he's he's just going to sit there and let Israel expend themselves and become the pariah of the world. And once they've 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 expended all their ammunition, and everybody hates them. Then he might do something. He's not a stupid man. And he's not really, you know, he'll use the Palestinian issue for his own advantage. But I don't, his actions show that he's got other things on my, in his mind. So we can uh, take, I don't need to look there. So, but I was thinking about the, the Zionist project, which is the state of Israel. And the context that arose in and why, because I've been thinking ever since the 7th investigating in my own mind, sort of the engineer of me, how could you make this work? How can you bring peace to that area? Because they have never been able to live at peace. Well, there's a reason why. It's a failed project. It's a, it's a, it should have been discarded, but because of the context of history, well, what once was possible no longer is and why it must be discarded now if they ever want peace, or relocated, uh, which I don't think they can do, because that's not Zionism. It has to be in Zion. It can't be someplace else. Uh, and that's impossible. It's a, simply an impossible project. Why? Because of Islam. See, when Zionism came about, we have to go back in history. We're talking about, uh, forget Christian Zionism. That's a, just an aberration. That's a heresy. It simply is. Dispensationalism is, is um, not a damnable heresy, but it is not biblical. It's a errant system that leads people astray in some areas, some areas more than others. And it diminishes the cross in Christ. simply does. The idea that some have that Israel can be saved without Christ. No, that is, it's anti-Christian in some ways. At least some, it, it's not one uniform system. There's some sex, some dispensational sex are anti-Christian, exceedingly anti-Christian. John Hagee is an anti-Christian. He doesn't believe the Bible. And he's on Israel's payroll. You know, when they give you a free jet, it comes with strings. Your own personal jet. 
for, to better serve the nation of Israel with. That guy's still around spouting his poison. But, uh, and he has a certain style to him. Okay, that's the, uh, Satan never has false prophets that don't have some style. Bar Kokhba uh, had a, uh, has, he was a charismatic personality. And he was able to lead the nation to destruction. Well, they weren't really a nation then, but he led the, 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 the sect of the Pharisees to destruction because there was, I think, two, two sects that remained after the destruction of the temple, the Christians, the Jewish Christian believers, and the Pharisees, the rabbinical Jews. And the one, the Pharisees, persecuted the Christians because they wouldn't join in the rebellion even unto death. The biggest enemy of, of Christianity in the beginning was, especially in Israel, was the Pharisees. Biggest enemy of Jesus, the Pharisees. Which held a system of religion that was not the law. It was the oral tradition, which is what rabbinical Judaism is, nothing but oral tradition. It's not has no real connection to the to the written Torah and the prophets. Uh, not really. But there's a context, a historical context that that made the Jewish Zionist project possible, but it was just temporary. Well, first of all, let's go back a bit to Constantine and the beginning of state quote unquote Christianity which isn't real Christianity at all. It is a, a form of watered-down Christianity that consists of rituals and doctrines that are connected with Christianity, but it is not the real thing. Real Christianity is, a, is individual reconciliation to God through faith in Jesus Christ, and it results in a, uh, or it's connected with, <laughs> There, there is some debate about exactly what takes place first. Uh, with being regenerated, being born again, same thing. Regeneration and the new birth are the same thing. Uh, from God uh, being a, becoming a new creation, God actually creates a new heart and a new spirit in you, and you are receive the gift of God's own spirit. So you are reconciled with him and restored to a a relationship, a proper relationship with God, restored much um, to something that is like what Adam had in the garden before sin, or better, really it's better. Uh, but we still have a, because our bodies have not yet been redeemed, we still have sin present in our mortal bodies, and we live in a world that is in rebellion against God. That's real Christianity, New Testament Christianity, biblical Christianity. It is God's work. We are God, His handiwork. We are not human beings cannot make a Christian, but state Christianity reduces that to a watered down substance of form. So you've got a formalism, you've got rit rituals, you've got ceremonies, and you've got doctrines, but you don't have the power and the reality of real Christianity, which is that personal relationship and that, that new birth, that new creation in you that only God can do and is utterly dependent on the cross. Well, state Christianity isn't. It's just another form of religion that serves political purposes, which is why Constantine did it. Now, he didn't bring it to its final state. It was about 390 when uh, Christianity became the official, state Christianity became the official and exclusive religion of Rome. Uh, prior to that, it was just the, uh, well, there was also Julian the, the apostate in between there. So. But that's, uh, and then when you talk about Roman Catholicism, that is a modified form of state Christianity. It's just when the the bishop of Rome is the head of the state instead of the emperor being the head of the state. In the east, you have imperial uh, Constantinianism. In the west, you have papal Constantinianism. Still the same thing. It's just who has the, the, the highest power. 
And then Protestantism is just a a reform movement within Roman Catholicism that got kicked out. And there was there was the division that occurred, which is typical, but it still is what's called magisterial. Uh, Protestantism, the, matter, the Magisterial Reformation. In other words, it maintained the state church synthesis that comes that dates back to Constantine. So it is not true Christianity. There did arise, because of the availability of Scripture, of the, uh, those who were called the Anabaptists, and some of those were true Christians and were fo- trying to follow Christ. Christ, real Christians follow Christ. Phony Christians don't follow Christ. So if you call yourself a Christian, but you deny the lordship of Jesus Christ, you deny God's authority over your life, and you don't think you have an obligation to, to try, you, you don't have a heart that seeks to follow him, well, you're not a Christian. You haven't been born again. And there's Christians like that. Some of them, sometimes they're often fundamentalists. They have a a shallow religion that's, form but doesn't have the substance of real Christianity. And this is a difficult world for real Christians to live in because of this confusion of church and state and this watered-down thing that's called Christianity versus the real Christianity that exists in people that have been born again. So we're, we, we have, it's, it, when things are black and white, when you live in a, a nation, a country that openly persecutes you, and they're, they don't hold to Christ at all. They're antagonistic to Christ. Well, then you know you're, where you stand. Like if you're a Christian in an Islamic country or a pagan country or whatever, you know where you stand. So there's not this confusion. There's clarity. But in the United States, we're told that this is a Christian country, which in, if you look at it, no, it doesn't even have Christian beginnings, but it, it does come out of England, which was a state Christian system. So it was the rebel, the rebellion was not just against the king, but against the religion of the king, too. It's a secular pagan country, always has been. It was, there was a rebellion against Christianity among the founders, and none of them were Christians. None of them were Christians. They might have attended church once in a while. They might have been baptized. So in a sense, they were Constantinian Christians, but they rejected the church-state synthesis. So they were anti-Constantinian, and they were pagans because they did, they did not hold to Christ at all. I mean, you have people like Jefferson that, that took his scissors and sliced up the New Testament according to his own personal whims. You had, you had uh, uh, Washington. Of course, all these men held to a form of Christianity externally. They would attend church occasionally. But, const- uh, but Washington, his own pastor, said that he's a, he's a deist. He never showed up for communion, which means he wasn't a Christian. I mean, communion, if— a, a, a real Christian, the one time they want to show up is for communion, yet generally. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes oh, the preacher's not any good at all, but but we are the the center app, act of worship for Christians really is communion. That's when we we our focus is on Christ and what He did for us, and we are His people, and we are partakers of His life, and we share that all together. Is sometimes not done very well, but still, uh, that is that is important for us. Even though Protestants have sort of watered that down a whole lot, in some ways, uh, the centrality of that in Roman Catholicism is more. Even though it's been mutilated, it's still uh, the practice is more in line with New Testament Christianity because apparently they did it every every Sunday. Uh, early in the morning, part of their weekly worship. There was only one service, too. <laughs> yeah, it wasn't uh, church five nights a week or anything like that. But uh, so s- some ways Protestants uh, and Baptists have, have watered down some of the power even of, of Christianity. They, some of the, they, they just, you know, there's, there's weaknesses everywhere. Uh 
But uh, so that's so you have this state church synthesis that becomes Constantin that Constantin began, and that becomes what is called Christianity or Christendom. So let's ramp the time forward ahead, and uh, many of the Jew the most of the Jews in the world lived under. Christianity, for part of, well, I shouldn't say most of them. A lot of them lived under Islam, and then you had, uh, especially with the ascent of European civilization, Christendom, you had uh, more and more of the Jews living under that. But they, they didn't, they weren't really citizens. So you, you, to be a citizen in Christendom meant you were a Christian. Uh, if you were not baptized Christian, you weren't really a citizen. It was part of being a citizen in a Christian country. Get, just getting sprinkled as a baby is how you became a Christian. And it was a matter of citizenship. And so when the Anabaptists came along and they rejected that and I said, no, it's what's in the New Testament. We have to follow Christ. Uh, baptism is for believers. It's for people who have committed their lives to Christ. It's, it's for those who are actually disciples of Jesus. Uh, and if you're not that, and it has the state religion stuff is not real, it's not real Christianity, it's not genuine Christianity, and they were absolutely right. And what did the state Christianity do to them? Killed them, murdered them, hunted them down like wild animals, uh, baptized them the third and final time, uh, burned them at the stake, tortured them, beheaded them, everything they could imagine they did to the Anabaptists. Why? Because they were seeking to be real Christians which made a lie out of their Constantinian Christianity. It, made, it, sh it sh showed that y y this is not real. This is not really biblical Christianity. So it, it, Constantine, I think, decided to use Christianity as the glue to hold his empire together because there was nothing holding Rome, Rome together other than raw power. There was nothing to unite their hearts together the idea of Rome. Uh, so, and Christianity demonstrated that power, so he wanted to use it as a cohesive force, but it you, it can't be real Christianity, so you'd water it down. It was already getting pretty weak by that time anyway. So that's what happened there. And then when, when like the scripture gives birth to real Christians, like some of the Anabaptists, it doesn't mean that's, that there aren't real Christians in these other groups too, like Roman Catholicism or Protestantism, but it is that personal relationship. But with the Anabaptists coming along, especially with believer's baptism, they were denying the validity of the infant baptism that made you a citizen of the Christian country. And because of that, that's why baptism became the the reason that you put the Anabaptists to death, because they were they were ungluing Christian so-called Christian civilization, which wasn't truly Christian civilization at all, but it was this Constantinian synthesis with a watered down form of Christianity. So, uh, Christendom or uh, Christian civilization. We could think of it as it's not pagan, but it's not truly Christian either. It is this, in this twilight zone, and it's confusing for Christians, and it's confusing for the world. Because like the Crusades, they weren't Christianity. They weren't real Christians. They were following something that was the, of this Constantinian muddle. See, it's like oil and water. I mean, you can make a salad dressing, you can put oil and water together and shake it, but it'll separate. It wants to separate. And that's what true Christianity, true Christians, we don't belong to this world. So we will never belong to these mixtures that call themselves Christianity that aren't. The state church mixture. No, it's and Protestants, that was what it was. It was other than the Anabaptists, which are a separate group, and they don't come out, they're not Reformed Catholics. They are people that are born of God's Word and are seeking to follow Christ, uh, what, is what uh, evangelicals are supposed to be. But we have a real problem in the United States because there's this confusion 
of we're told this is a Christian country, but if you look at history, it's not a Christian country at all. It's a rejection of Christian civilization. So it has ideas that are that have their roots in Christianity, sort of Christian influence. Christian, see, a Christian civilization can have Christian values up to a point, but not to the point of actually following Christ. So you run into all these problems, like, and you'll find confessions that say oaths are lawful. Christ said, no, they're not. Taking up the sword is lawful. Christ said, no, it's not. So you, you immediately become in conflict with Christ because what the state needs is no longer compatible with what Christ says. So real Christians are always in, we're always strangers and aliens in this world. But so you take this Christian civilization, this Constantinian, this Christendom, and now let's get back over to the Middle East. Now, again, where does Zionism come from? England. It comes out of England. Now, in England, you have a Christian civilization uh, that is mm, usually tolerant of Jews, more so than, say, Germany and uh, uh, Russia, where you have periodic program, uh, pogroms, especially by the time of the 20th century, late 19th century and 20th century. By that time, there was freedom of religion in England uh, prior to, well, it was sometime in the 17th century, or 18th century, I believe that was actually officially declared, but uh, <clears throat> prior to the, uh, what did they call it, the Great Revolution or whatever it was, uh, of 1689, thereabouts, uh, where there was toleration for other Christian sects, like the Baptists. Prior to that, Baptists were a persecuted minority. After that, they were just a frowned-on minority. But they weren't openly persecuted. They weren't in violation of the law for meeting together, uh, because England had a state church. But at that time, they, they, it, was a, it was still the established religion, but they had tolerated other Christians, and, and Jews were afforded some toleration, but they weren't really Christians or citizens in a true sense, uh, although that began to fade away, too. Uh, a Christian, being a Christian as part, being a citizen began to, uh, the ideas of the Enlightenment began to permeate, and Christian, Christianity became even, even more diluted, much more diluted. Even, even, is that like much more? You know, the, one of the problems with learning other languages is your native language becomes worse. Because some of these language patterns sort of mix and cross over. And then if you can't speak fluently anyway, because you're trying to think while you're doing this, I'm doing this extemporaneously. I have a vague idea what I want to say. And we'll see where it goes. Obviously, it's why it takes so long, but so but that's just a complicated story. But the context here: so you have have the rise of civilizational diluted Christianity, and in that context of uh, in England at that time, there was toleration, certainly toleration of the Jews. You had Jews in government, all kinds of things. They weren't considered aliens, uh, and out of that. You have, and out of the, the rise of nationalism and the desire, you had this desire for a Jewish nation arising. And, of course, at the beginning of the 20th century, the Ottoman Empire still exists. And that is, has ruled over the Ottoman Empire, and before that, other caliphates have ruled over the Levant, the area of Palestine, and Egypt, and all of North Africa, and most of the Middle East, and much of Europe for 1,300 years. And in Palestine, at the beginning of the 20th century, you had, you had Muslims, and you had Christians, and you had uh, especially Christian Arabs, and you had, had Jews. So uh, Arabs, both Christ, uh, Christian and Muslim, uh, Muslims were the majority, and they'd been and, and Jews, and they'd been living there for 
1,300 years under Islam. And before that, of course, Christians and Jews both, both go back. I mean, this kind of Judaism goes back to essentially 70 A.D. And Christians, of course, go back to the time of Christ. None of this is Old Testament Judaism at this point, not at all. With the, temp with the destruction of the temple, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, what do they call themselves? Not the Herodians, but the others. Uh, that the temple cult ended, and the covenant of Moses was no more. Christ fulfilled it, so it was God removed the temple because it was no longer of any use. The real had come; the shadow was no more. And the Pharisees had their own system that was separate from the temple, so they didn't need the temple anyway. Under their uh, system of the oral Torah, the secret Torah, the unwritten Torah. But uh, so out of England, in England, you have the rise of the uh, the ideas with the nationalism and uh, the Enlightenment thinking, and John Locke, some of this was, was leaking over. Uh, so you had a rise of, of secular Judaism, and secular Judaism didn't have Judaism to hold it together. It was so, which it makes no sense. Secular Judaism, which is present. Uh, when I was in Israel, it was the dominant population. Relig uh, practicing Jews were a minority, really. So mostly seculars, which were non-practicing Jews. So what, what, holds, what holds that together? Aha, I just thought of something. That's why they want the temple. <laughs> So sec secular Judaism, by its nature, is nonsense. Nonsense. It, it is is simply an ethnicity. But there is no Jewish ethnicity. Look at the. You got Ethiopian Jews that look like Ethiopians, and you've got Ashkenazi Jews, European Jews that look like Englishmen, or Germans, or Poles, or Russians. And you've got Mediterranean Jews that look like Mediterranean people. Why is that? You suppose there was some mixture in there? Yeah, it's not really an ethnic identity. And without the religious identity, what do you have left? I don't know. So, but there was this this imp so out of this this impossible void, this vacuum of secular Judaism, Zionism arose. We have to have a project. Which is was just, just oh my! I just these thoughts that occurred to me while I'm saying these things. This happens in Christianity all the time. So you've got a church that's dying because it's not really Christian. <laughs> what do you do to get it going again? Build a new building, 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 building. Oh, that'll always get people to come. That'll get people to give money. You can bring in a lot more money than you need to build the building. Simply want to have a new building. So that becomes the focus uh, because they don't have anything else to focus on. They just become stagnant. So you got to have something to move you, to motivate you, something that unites you. And so if you're secularists, secularist Jews, what is that? What unites them? They got to have a project. Zionism. And it's a secular project. You've got these crazy Christians that don't know how to read the Bible that have this Christian Zionism that even predates that uh, by almost 100 years. goes back to the early part of the 19th century, and this is the later part of the 19th century. So did they get the idea from, the, from, the Dar from Darby and his followers? I don't know. Of course, Christians, the reason they want to see the Jews back in the land and the temple rebuilt is because of a particular understanding of uh, prophecy. And they believe, the people that hold to dispensationalism, the, the Zionists, Christian Zionists, or all, these are all almost all dispensationalists, and almost all Zion, uh, Christian dispensationalists are Zionists, 
Why do they want these things? Because they believe that Jesus will come and deliver them out of this world before any of the disasters, any of the tribulation, any of the troubles, any of the destructions and plagues that happen to Israel take place. They, they don't care about Israel. In fact, I was out uh, when I was out in prayer several days ago. I go out in the park someplace in the wilderness, take a hike and talk to God. I don't want prayer meetings. I think are I don't like prayer meetings, public prayer and worship. Okay, but I don't want to get together with a bunch of people and sit around and pray while others are listening because it's conversation with God. I I don't want to be you know. I'm not talking to them. I'm talking to God. Jesus said, when you pray, go into your closet and get away. What did he do? He would go up on top of a hill someplace away from his disciples, and he would pray there. Him and his father would pray. We'd have to talk together. And that's what I do. I go out. I want to get away from everybody. I don't want to be interrupted by people. I don't want to be concerned about... They're, they're, they're not... I don't want an audience... So I want to get away and talk to God. So I was out there, and I'm, you know, the stuff that's going on in the Middle East has been troubling me badly. So I'm over there, out there, and it's not that I hear God's voice, but he does enlighten me. He does give me understanding. So it is a two, two-way conversation. I'm not a prophet. I speak to God. He hears me. Every Christian understands this. But when I ask him, to, well, I want to have your mind. I want to have, and one of the things, I, you know, that seeing that what Israel's doing, you know, it's really hard to, to, to not want to hate. I mean, we can have righteous ind indignation, but that can tend to move toward hate. Our flesh wants to go toward hate. So, God, I want your heart and your mind in this. I want to see things the way you see them because I'm not capable of that. He is. And the Spirit of God dwells in me. Every Christian, every real Christian, the Spirit of God dwells in you. The Scripture says you have the mind of Christ. And so we want to, what does, we want to have that mind, understand things the right way, his way. And I wasn't even thinking about this, but as I was doing this, I suddenly had the realization that the, the, pre-trib Zionist dispensationalist I want to say cult or sect or something like that but the, the, the these ideas that are so prevalent in dispensationalism in the United States and in England that's where it arose it arose in England where Zionism arose where secular Jewish Zionism arose in England and oh boy there's got to be some connections there but I suddenly had the understanding that this is this pre-trib rapture is really based on selfishness because it's not about God's will. It's not about the gospel. It's not about being witnesses for Jesus, being the light of the world, but rather it's about escaping trouble, escaping personal difficulty, escaping tribulation, which is pressure, getting out of the difficulties. And this has never arisen in places where Christians are persecuted, only where they haven't been persecuted in recent history, like in England, like in the United States, where we don't experience tribulation and persecution for being Christians. So we don't want to suffer. Why should we suffer? Why should we suffer with Christ? Well, he told us to go out in all the world and and preach the gospel. To be, we're, we are the light of the world. Why would God take the light of the world out when judgment's falling? How are they going to know what's going on if we're not here to tell them? It's, it's unbiblical. I mean, if, if God did not spare his own son, why would he think that he would spare us from any, any difficulties? When most of Christians in the world experience far more difficulty for being Christians than we do. It's like, a, oh, because we're we're Anglo Americans, we're 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 not supposed to suffer at all. Apparently, it's it's just it is it is not it is a selfishness in Christianity. It is a self centeredness 
that doesn't even look to the will of God, but rather wants our own personal. And you went, God bless me, God bless me, God bless me. It's Joel Osteenism kind of stuff. Uh, and it is a defect in Anglo-American Christianity. And that's one of the defects in dispensationalism. It is an escape route. It is to escape difficulties. The promise of being delivered out of so-called the wrath of God, but the tribulation period has nothing to do with the wrath of God. It is God's last call. It is God's trying to get the world to repent. And what it, all these disasters and everything, like in uh, so much of the time in the wilderness, God would bring, bring pl plagues on Israel, but it wasn't for the purpose of making them suffer. It was for the purpose of discipline. You know, when a, when a father has to physically apply discipline to a child, it is not pleasant. And you should never do it in anger. But there are times when you have to make a necessary impression on your children, something that they will remember so they don't do something again that might be dangerous to their very life. Like go running off with a friend and, you know, when you're a small kid following like an older kid and disappearing. And you, nobody knows where you are in this world. That's dangerous. Much more dangerous than out when I was younger. But, uh, and there's times, you know, when your kid is repeatedly plays in the street, when you've told them not to do it, you have to apply sometimes physical dis discipline to make them understand that because they're not ready, they're not they're not at the point where they can rationally understand the danger. They're just acting emotionally. I want to do it. I want to do it. Rather than thinking, if I'm playing in the street, not paying attention, it comes coming down the road at 60 miles an hour, I could be dead. They don't think like that. They just follow their desires. And you have to apply some discipline sometimes in order to make a sufficient impression to realize that can bring bad things. They're not rational at that age. So you can't treat them as rational people. Out of love, you have to apply discipline. And when you've got an unregenerate people, you know, God I was like, what a mess. But see, that's that. but that was all temporary until Christ would come in. So we have this English... Christendom, and out of that, the other mess that calls itself secular Zionism, unbelieving Jews, they got to have some cause. Otherwise, what are they? So they have to make their Jewish identity central and jump onto this popular thing at the time called nationalism. So we have to have a Jewish state, a Judenstaat, because we're a special people. So we have to have a special place. Well, that special place has to be in Zion, Zionism, in Jerusalem. Why? Because we worship God? Of course not. We don't care about God. We don't believe in God. We believe in ourselves. It's humanism, the exaltation of man. <laughs> and, the, and the British, who are highly influenced by Christian Zionism, rampant in the world at that time, including among the, uh, the nobility was sponsoring prophetic conferences in, in Europe there in England. Um, some of them were very much into this stuff. And of course, human flesh being what it is, sinful humanity, the Brits say, hey, we can get behind this. We, we can help them get their own place and, and in the process, Get them out of England, too. <laughs> because at the same time, they were passing anti-immigration laws to keep Jews from immigrating to England. <laughs> Mixed motives here. So, But at this time, Britain and France, but especially Britain, was dominating the world, dominating the Muslim world. The Ottoman Empire is still in existence, but it's called the sick man of Europe, and the French and the British are already carving it up even before they have killed the turkey. Uh, so 
you know, it was uh, World War I killed the turkey, killed the Ottoman Empire. And then they're slice, but they're slice. They're already preparing to slice it up in advance. Uh, with the, the Sykes Picot Treaty, that secret treaty between the French and the British, they already divided it all up. So, in World War One, the the British march into Jerusalem. Allenby takes Jerusalem, and you know, at that point, and then the League of Nations, which is another scam uh, of the the victors of World War One. Uh, decide to give it away. <laughs> I suspect there was some anti-Semitic uh, motivation there, too. Yeah, let's get rid of these Jews. Give them their own place. Shoo them off to, to uh, that place we don't care about. See, the Brits did not care about Palestine. I mean, nobody cared about Palestine. It was part of the Ottoman Empire. So it's like, eh, there's this biblical place. Yeah, uh, yeah they can live there. It didn't belong to Britain, it didn't. Even under the uh, the League of Nations, they had a mandate uh, mandate to to administer it. They weren't given possession of it; it wasn't theirs. They just had a a mandate from this group, this self appointed group of the victors of World War One, to uh, to divide the world up. Apparently. And that's what they did, divide the Ottoman Empire up, at least. Why didn't they do this to the Germans? Well, they did to some degree. They, they gave the, Wur, the the Ruhr Valley, the industrial area of Germany, to the French to administer as punishment. You know, they were, and they sowed the seeds of World War II in the process. But so you have the English. Now, the English had already dominated uh a large chunk of Africa, including Egypt at this time. Egypt was not a colony, but it was, shall we say, a dependency? A vassal state, indeed. Uh, they were the ones that that controlled who the king. Uh, he was a puppet, a vassal of England. Well, there's vassal, you know, the, the empire in which the sun never sets. So it was in its heyday at this time. It was, uh, even though they had gotten seriously damaged by World War I, them and the French, their empire was still at its peak. And again, uh, with British domination and then the British control over Palestine, it created an environment for the secular Zionists to, uh, to try to have this project, which is really to provide, you know, what do secular Zionists do? Since they don't go to synagogue, what, what is what is the meaning of being a secular Zionist? There is no meaning. It's insane. So you have to make your own meaning. They're postmodernists. They are existentialists, apparently. Pre, the pre-existentialists, the proto-existentialists. So we have to create our own reason to exist. Let's make a Jewish state where we will rule. We will be the masters, and we can dominate everybody else. So you have the victim mentality feeding into this and the, the supremacist urge and everything. It's just human flesh, the human sinfulness, all mixed up into the creation of the Zionist state. And the, the mixed motives of England, too, both the dispensationalists, let's make Jesus come faster— by doing this, we'll 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 get we'll make prophecy accelerate here. We'll create the Jew and his, so to try to fulfill their own vision, their own understanding of end times prophecy, which is not exactly biblical. In some ways it is, but in some ways it's not. It's a distortion. Uh, certainly better than amillennialism or postmillennialism or the what was common Augustinian ideas, which were not biblical at all. Uh, which were not early Christian at all either. They were, again, the product of state Christianity. By the time Augustine came along, it was truly state Christianity. Uh, there was no, uh, that was, it was an intolerant form of state Christianity too, as state Christianity always is. Sooner or later, unless it's so watered down, it doesn't really serve a purpose anymore. 
again, like secular Judaism. What the heck is that? It makes no sense. So, oh, we got to have a purpose. So we're going to be the proto-existentialists and create our own purpose for life. So they bought, they planted this. What could you, could you plant? They had started to purchase some land under the Ottomans, but it was, you know, the Ottomans would never have allowed it to, to get to an independent state. You know, well, we'll sell you some land, but we're still in charge. You know, the Ottomans were still there. But the the British control of Palestine created the opportunity for it creating a Jewish state. And the Belfort Declaration, they said, yeah, we'll look upon that favorably, never giving any thought to the Palestinians. You know, the Brits, they don't care. It wasn't even part of their empire. They don't care. Nothing to them. Other than maybe encouraging some of the Jews to leave England. Um, they didn't want a national Jewish movement in England. There was no place for it there. And so, and they wanted support from the Jewish community in World War I. What kind of support? Money. Who was the Belfort Declaration written to? Lord Rothschild. Why do you think they, they, they said that? Do you think they had a motive? Yeah, the love of money. They wanted financial support for World War I. What did the Jews finance throughout the history in Europe after they accumulated this large piles of money through banking, through compound interest? They funded the wars. The kings would go to the Jewish bankers, to the Rothschilds and other mega banking families, and borrow money. And then their citizens had to pay it back. And it was, who knows what the interest rates were. And then the citizens, of course, resent the Jewish community because they have to pay more taxes because their king borrowed money from the Jewish bankers. Uh, because only the Jews could do banking in the Middle Ages in Europe, because Christians were forbidden. You can't charge interest. You can load money, but you couldn't charge interest on it. In the Old Testament, you couldn't. Jews couldn't loan money to Jews and charge interest either. Uh, but Jews were allowed to charge interest because they weren't Christians. See? That, that, well, it sounded like a good idea at the time. <laughs> now we have to live with the whole mess. But so, but see, you couldn't have you couldn't have created the the Judenstadt under the Ottoman Empire. It, it wouldn't have worked. They might have allowed you to settle there. But you'd still be under the Ottomans. You'd still be under Islam. No, that wouldn't be an independent state. You'd just simply be a, a, a Jewish colony under Muslims, which is where the Jews that lived there already were. Uh, they, they were a Jewish community under Islam. And apparently the secular Jewish uh, uh, Zionists didn't want to be a Jewish community with no reason to exist under the British Empire in England. Even though they had freedom of religion, they didn't believe in religion. <laughs> what do you do? Create a state. <laughs> what everybody was doing then. Got to have a purpose. We got to be the proto-existentialists uh, and create our own reason to be. So that's the Jewish state. Huh. How am I doing at a time? I'm extending. All right. So, okay, you can get away with this as long as the Brits are in control. But then there was some friction arising because what? There's a population there. The Palestinians are already there. And you're moving in these European Jews from England and other countries. And all of a sudden, the locals are getting a little concerned. Uh, they're buying up our land. They were buying it at that time, the Jewish National Fund and other things. They were they're buying land in Israel or the in Palestine. And you know, and some people they're looking for the money and they're not thinking and their interest is just on themselves, like humanity in general. 
and then their neighbors get concerned. All of a sudden, look what's happening to our neighborhood here. Uh, what's going on? We have this com Christian community here, and all of a sudden, we're surrounded by these Jewish Europeans that don't speak Arabic. They're strangers. They're doing their own thing. They're they're carrying guns around, and and the the, the Muslims like, what the heck? What's going on here? You know, if it was the Ottomans, they'd, they'd complain, and the the the, uh, the uh, whatever they called the Pasha or whatever they called them in uh, uh, the, the Ottoman uh, head <laughs> would have said the Caliph, the Caliphate there would have said, uh, "Well, no, you can't do that stuff," and you, no, I'm not going to allow any more immigration. But he was already, you know, the Ottoman Empire was was sick even before this. When they started buying the land, they were you know, trying to be Europeans. That didn't mix very well. So as long as the Brits were in control, okay, okay. The, well, yeah, we made this promise. They, they loaned us some money, so yeah. But then when it started, the friction began uh, to, to arise, they began to cut back on the immigration. And that's when the Jewish project began to become terrorists. The Irgund and others, because this project was their whole reason to be. Again, these were not religious Jews. The religious Jews in Jerusalem rejected Zionism like they do today. The, the, the Hasidic Jews, the ultra-Orthodox, they reject Zionism. They reject the occupation. Because it's, it, their identity is religious. It's bound up in the, the Talmud in some form. And uh, uh, the, the mystical elements in Judaism. I, I wouldn't even say it's Talmudic Juda Judaism exactly. They tend to have uh, charismatic personnel, a particular rabbi that they, they follow, for example. And he's the authority. He's a living word, so to speak. Uh, not necessarily divine, but often are almost messianic uh, in a, a devotion to them. They, be, they, be, they are disciples of this particular rabbi, for example. And they are very devoted to them. Um, but it, it's not, it's, it's different. <laughs> but they're, they're, they are not, they have no devotion to the secular state of Israel. To them, it's an abomination. Only the Messiah can, can reestablish this, uh, Israel. The idea of a state isn't even it. It's the kingdom of God. Only, only the Messiah can do that. Only the Messiah can, re can re restore the, the temple if he wants to do that. And they are not certainly not committed to the idea of a physical temple, I don't think, because that's not consistent with, with rabbinical Judaism at all. Again, it was a, a, a religious system uh, to continue the Jewish people who no longer had the temple, who no longer had the sacrifices. And Christians get confused because we think it's like Old Testament Judaism. No, it's not, not at all. Uh, and so it, the secular Zionism, as some rabbis I've heard them say on the internet, is anti-Jewish because it destroys Judaism. It is godless, and it is existent. It created their god. The, essentially, you could you could look at it this way: uh, the god of secular Zionism is the project of secular Zionism. They have created their own god. They have built their own idol, their golden calf, if you will, which is the state of Israel. And that's their reason to be, their existential reason to be, is this project. Every man has to have a project. He can't just, you know, he has to do something. He has to build something. Every once in a while, you have to have, to have a project. Otherwise, what are you doing? Uh, women, they're different. They can just be their 
you know, take care of the kids and take care of the grandkids and do their interpersonal relationship stuff and be on the phone. And man, we got to build something. It's just the way we we're made. So I think, well, we need to build a nation, a secular Jewish nation. Oh, Lord. And now this turned into something else because the secular, you know, the secularism, existentialism simply doesn't work because people come to the point, yeah, well, we're doing something, but why? Now, somebody will ask the question, why? Why are we doing this? Well, so you have to go back to God. You have to go back to the Old Testament and justify it and say, yeah, and we got to restore the temple because secular Zionism isn't glue. Once you have the project Man, what happens once you finish a project? It gets put on the shelf someplace, right? Because it's no longer your reason to be. Once you're built, while you're building it, yes, that's the focus. But once it's finished, it's like, now what do we do? What do we do now? So you lose that glue that's necessary for a nation to give it an identity if it's not ethnicity, and that's when you're coming from all over the world, when you've got Ethiopians and uh, I can't, what do they call the Haredi, the the uh, the Middle Eastern Jews and the Ashkenazi, the European Jews, and of course you got English Jews and Russian Jews and the ultra Orthodox with the fur the fur hats that that come from different areas in Europe and where's the glue? Where's the glue? Now, if you're a refuge from persecution, yeah, that's sort of a glue. But what happens when there really is no persecution anymore? What's your reason to be? Well, they got to find a new one. So now it's religious Zionism and rebuilding the temple. But they never saw what what happens to the Palestinians. You've got this fest, festering store of the store of the Palestinians. They don't care about the Palestinians. The Palestinians are a problem. They want them gone, Permanent, permanently, preferably. Just want them gone because they're an obstacle. They've got this project. They don't. They're not part of the nation. They can never be part of the Zionist project. They can never be part of Israel because it's a Zionist project. They're not Jews. They don't belong. They're not part of our identity. And they're an obstacle because they claim that this is their land. <laughs> we got to do something with them. Well, they're doing it now. But it's, it's too, it's like the temple. Why, why is there a commitment of this not Netanyahu and the, the right religious extremists to build the temple? Did they really care? Did they really want to sacrifice animals? Did they really believe in the Torah? No, oh, no. That's why they got the monument to Bar Kokhba, that pagan menorah in front of the Knesset with all the images on it, which are verboten under the law of Moses. <sighs> yeah. So what are they doing? They've got to have that object that unites them, like like the black stone in Mecca that we can all go to and circumambulate about. What is it, seven times? I don't know. Been a while since I studied that. But So we need the, a, a center that is religious because secularism is not good glue because it doesn't affect your heart. Atheism can never be a thing of the heart. It's like a denial of God can never inspire devotion. Really, it won't last long. Like the Soviet Union, how long did it last? 70 years. That's The, the, the promises turn out to be empty. Just like the, the, the pro, well, materialism. Uh, if you're building a project or or uh, say you're buying something you want, oh, I, if I only had that, I'd be happy. So you buy it, you get it, you work and save, whatever, and you get your 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 dream, your your new pickup truck or whatever it is. And then as soon as you get it, you say, why did I buy this? I'm in debt for 
for 13 years or something or seven years to pay this thing off. Why did I do this? It doesn't do anything my old truck didn't do. But it's it's the desire, and then it turns out to be an empty promise. You thought it would fulfill you and thought it would satisfy the itch, whatever it is. And uh, obviously, truck is not a particular one, but people go into bondage for years for one of those things, even deeper bondage nowadays. But it, it doesn't satisfy because it's not God. It's not God. So it, it has to be something that goes deeper than material things. It has to be deeper than, than atheism, godlessness. And so, well, why don't we, we rebuild the temple? Uh, so we can really make a scam out of that. We can make all the Jews in the whole world come to us every three times a year. Wow, that'll really uh, energize the tourist industry. Uh, we, we could turn Gaza into a big airport. Once we level it off, turn it into a big airport or something. Netanyahu Airport, bigger than Ben-Gurion. And it's probably about as close to, uh, almost as close to Jerusalem as, as uh, uh, Tel Aviv is. Uh, see, it's, it's, but see, here the, here's the issue. So the Zionist project, and now the amplified, regenerated, reinvigorated religious Zionist project with the, the, the pure ethnic identity with, uh, and religious identity with uh, ultimately the temple as the focus for global Judaism, the temple. So Israel really becomes the focus of the whole Jewish world, whereas not with, see, under rabbinic Judaism, it's really not important. Israel is not important under that, just as a historical symbol, you know, an idea, but not, uh, it's not connected to Talmudic Judaism, really, which was created to, to not need the temple. The problem is, with the whole project, the Brits are no longer in control. The European empires which dominated Islam uh, through the 19th and 20th century, well, guess what happened? You had the rise of nationalism among the Arabs with people like Nasser and others, not really Islam, but then nationalism, of course, is empty. It doesn't satisfy because the problem with humanity is this disconnection from God to start with. So there's this emptiness in us by nature that can only be satisfied with God because we're made to be his temples, his image. Without that, you can never scratch the itch. It's always going on from one thing to another and never finding satisfaction because satisfaction is only found in God and being what you're supposed to be. So, the nationalism among the Arabs became, why are we doing this? Nasser, okay, well, what are we doing here? Well, we can do war, we can go fight with Israel. Yeah, well, that gets empty after a while, too. But, so you, but what happens out of that, after the failure of nationalism among the Arabs, the return, the, the resurgence of Islam a resurgence Islam, uh, and a return to a more fundamentalist view of Islam. Now, not entirely, but like you have uh, Egypt, or uh, you had a period there where the, the uh, Egyptian, the Brotherhood uh, was in charge. And you had, uh, you know, for a while under Obama, <laughs> remember that period? until the United States decided, now let's go back to a military coup uh, with uh, CC or whoever he is now, uh, another American project. And you have, see, America is, is an empty project too. America is a failed state because there's no glue. There's no glue. 
nationalism and the images, the, the idols of America, the, the founding fathers, the, idol, the idols. That's what they are. They're, they're, uh, you're taught to worship the founding fathers and their ideas and everything else, but it, it has no glue. It doesn't work because it's empty. It's empty because it's godless. America is godless. It's not even a Christian. With, without, without God, it has no meaning, to, reason to be. Nothing has a reason to be without God. Nothing exists apart from Him. So, so if, if like existentialism and postmodernism and this, this stuff is insane. It, it's a civilization that gives itself to that is finished. Is terminal. It's already in terminal stage uh, because there's there's nothing there. It's just emptiness. Materialism is just emptiness. Capitalism it's emptiness. Don't you know that? If you've lived a while, you should have understood that because no matter what you try to scratch the itch with, it doesn't work. Never satisfied because it's not what you need. You need to be restored to that proper relationship with God. Otherwise, you can't be satisfied. So you have the rise out of the, the emptiness of nationalism. First, you have the decline of Islam. Uh, the, the Ottomans just are dying of old age. And then they ally themselves with the with Germany in World War I, and they are defeated. And, of course, the Brits really were the ones. That, Britain really didn't defeat the Ottomans. Gallipoli was uh, not a British victory. Nevertheless, at the end of the war, uh, the Ottoman Empire is sliced up by the British and the French. And so you have Brits in charge of, Zion, of the land of Zion, the land of the ancient land of Palestine, of Israel. And all of a sudden, the Zionist project takes on new life. Secular Zionism comes in under the British. Okay, it's the British then too excited about it and because it's causing problems with their other areas that are under the control called the, the Arabs, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt, all these other areas they've been dominating. And then the, the British Empire falls apart. It doesn't survive World War I, two, World, War, World, World, World War II. And so the, the, the death of the empires, the, the World War II is the final death stroke except for the American empire, which is a different kind of empire that is dying, too, because it has no core. It has no value. It is simply an empty promise. Materialism, capitalism, and political moralism and idealism is empty. It has no substance to it. It's just empty. And therefore, America is dying. Natural process. Never had ability to last. It's, it was... The seeds of its own death were in its conception and is coming to that stage now. But uh, the European domination, especially the British domination of Palestine, pre uh, created the seedbed for the Zionist project. With the rise of Israel, with the resurgence of Islam, with, with uh, Turkey and Egypt to a lesser degree now, but Certainly, there is the the uh, uh, among the the masses of Egypt. There is definitely resurgence of Islam, uh, in, in spite of what the current government is. There is certainly not a secular government, but uh, it is much more secular than the the people are. The same in Turkey, even though it's it, it is it is uh, an Islamist government in Turkey, and of course you have. Uh, Syria, the government's more secular. The United States came over in and overthrew the secular governments. The, the Green Revolutions were all Islamic revolutions with the support of the United States. The, the overthrow of, of Saddam Hussein, uh, the attempted overthrow of, um, I can't remember his name in, in uh, Syria at the moment, but and also the, the you, of course you have the the prototypical resurgence of Islam in Iran with the overthrow of the Shah. The Shah was never, ever, ever the government of the people. It was an imposed government by the United States. 
So you have the death of the European empires as far as control of this part of the world. And so now the Zionist project finds itself in a hostile environment. What the heck? Where's the Brits? Oh, oh, there's the Americans. And so America, the inheritor of the British Empire, there's no other way to look at it. I mean, also part of the French Empire. We, we tried to inherit. We tried to inherit uh, Indonesia or uh, in, uh, Indochina. Uh, Indochina. The, we, we tried to inherit the, the uh, Indo-Chinese uh, uh, French Empire. We said, uh, when they were getting beaten by the Vietnamese, oh, we'll come in, we'll take over for you. Da! How did that work out? Stupid Americans. Uh, they don't understand anything. I mean, talk about ugly, ugly Americans, no wonder. Just dumb. We, we, we are so naive and stupid. Uh, we think the whole world is like, we look in the mirror and think, oh, yeah, we're of the whole world. Uh, no, you're not. But with the resurgence of Islam, because naturally, and nationalism's empty. Uh, people have to have God in some form. Without that, there's life has no meaning. Existentialism and atheism has, are meaningless. And you end up with what we have in America today, like people trying to find their meaning and in, uh, in all kinds of sexual perversions. I mean, it is, it is a search for meaning. You can't find it there, though. It's, a, it's an empty, it's a dead end. Just like materialism is a dead end. Just like uh, politics are a dead end. Just like philosophy is a dead end. All these things because we're made to be in a very intimate relationship with God. Things like Islam are a dead end, too, and Judaism is a dead end because it can't actually satisfy that. It claims that, but it cannot actually give you that relationship with God. So it is a, these are dead ends, too. But, the, the, but that's also why the Zionist project has mutated to a religious Zionism because secularism is dead. It has a very short lifespan. No longer than the the uh, the Soviet Revolution, the Communist Revolution in Russia, it only lasted seventy years. The actual rev the the but the the uh, the impetus, the popular impetus, the popular devotion to communism didn't last more than a generation at the most, because people quickly realized this is not what they promised. The promises are empty. It doesn't satisfy. Well, same as the same problem exists in most religion too. It's not, but it it has. Uh, it appears to be more promising, and it is because it is the worship of a transcendent reality, uh, it, where he, the the most deadheaded failure is humanism. The exaltation of man as the ultimate reality is just. It's ridiculous. There, there is no human beings can't live with that. They become dead inside because it's not. We, you have to live within your created purpose, and human beings are created to be the image of God. Even though we're fallen, that that need that is still there to to return to that. Because that's our created purpose. Without that, we're nothing. But religious Zionism, so they they've they've had to reject the the secularism because it, and Israel's proved it at the dead end. Well, well, we created this thing. Now what? No purpose. They have to go on to a new project. But they're doing it in a hostile environment having created this huge injustice that they weren't concerned about of the Palestinians, displacing the Palestinians. So they've got this massive historic injustice that is an ongoing injustice because Palestinians are still there till Netanyahu gets done, apparently. So no matter what you do, unless you wipe them all out to the last person, that injustice will never just simply be an historic injustice, but a continuing injustice, all at the expense of your uh, project. 
your so-called religious project. Well, what kind of a religion do you have to come up with that justifies this? The religion of Amalek, the destruction of Amalek. So you can't look at the, the true core of God's revelation. You have to look at these isolated events that are not consistent with the, the real message. I mean, there, there are things that happened, and God might have commanded them, but it is not the message itself. It's just historic things that happened. That is not the relationship that we have to have with God. So it's an empty promise, but it's still, but they're driven to it. They're driven to it because of their own emptiness it's and their own sinfulness, and they're manifesting that. So what kind of religion will this religious Jewish state be? We're seeing it in front of our eyes. A genocidal, um, religion, an ethnic cleansing religion, a murderous, barbaric religion, because that's what they're doing. They're showing us the very fruit of religious Zionism while we're looking on. <sighs> this is a dead end project. And the reason I was looking at Bar Kokhba is because that was a form of religious Zionism. Uh, a, mess a messianic figure to restore the Jewish state, to restore the temple. And what happened? Another utter disaster. See, Israel had, has had their, uh, their Nakbas too, the 70 AD and the one, I'm going to say 135, instead of, you know, it was a period of time, but 135 is when Bar Kokhba was killed. Uh, and they're repeating it. History will repeat again. They are they are rising up and doing this in the midst of the world and making the world, the entire world, hostile to them. Raise, uh, the hatred against, you know, they talk about anti-Semitism. Well, just like, uh, um, what's her name? Uh, Harris came out and announced the, the White House Biden initiative to fight anti, uh, to fight anti, uh, what is it, Islamophobia, they call it. Uh, that's not the problem. Uh, Anti-Semitism will be the problem because the entire world will hate Israel because we see what Israel's doing. And it will result in the destruction of Israel, just like Bar Kokhba led Israel to absolute destruction uh, in 132, they followed this false messiah, just like the Jewish re revolt in 70 AD led to uh, a, a Jewish Nakba, uh, the uh, destruction of the temple, and the, the uh, just an absolute terrible thing. It wasn't just the temple being destroyed. Essentially, a Jewish nation was destroyed in a very serious way. And... It'll repeat. It'll repeat. Because you're waging war on the entire world. And it shows that not only secular Judaism, secular Zionism is an empty system, but that religious Zionism is a murderous, genocidal system that has no respect for other people. And that raises the question of the United Nations Charter. How can countries like Israel possibly be members of the United Nations? Because they don't respect others as equals. They are superior. People that practice, nations that practice genocide and ethnic cleansing, they, they can, are in absolute violations of the Charter. How can they be members? And we, we have to really seriously ask the same question about resurgence Islam. How can an Islamic country that's committed to the teachings of Muhammad in the Quran actually be a member of the United Nations? Because the Quran, for example, in the Quran someplace, uh, I'm sure other people can look it up. I could too, but I'm not going to spend the time. Uh, where it talks about uh, 
Islam, as far as unbelievers, as far as Jews and Christians, you know, uh, it smite them, I'm, I'm, I'm smite them like with the sword until they feel submitted, uh, subdued. So once uh, uh, Christians and Jews are subdued, then they can live within the Muslim community as a subgroup of subdued dimmi, uh, where you're permitted to exist, you're permitted to practice your religion in a very limited, subdued sense, but you're not a citizen. How can people that practice that religion and apply it on a state level be members of the United Nations? Because you're not treating others as equals. It's contrary to your religion. Christians, we don't have a problem with that. We don't regard non-Christians as not equals, not equally human. We don't regard uh, sinful, wicked people as being less than human, just sinful, wicked people, which we all are in some degree. So we don't really have a problem with that because we're not— the idea of Christian nationalism is absolutely absurd. Real Christianity is not a state system. The idea of a Christian nation, uh, in a biblical sense, is absurd. That's Constantinianism. But the United Nations Charter, you know, it's supposed to be brotherhood of nations and— we're all for peace, and we don't want the things that World War I and World War II happening again. So we all agree that we'll do these things together to prevent that. Uh, and it doesn't work because it's the work of men. It's a, flaw, a flawed system. It's a flawed temple, a temple to human, humanity's efforts to build human civilization. It's secular. Secular is a failure because it doesn't deal with the real problem, which is the broken relationship between God and men, sinners. And the Jewish religious Zionist project will, well, we've se we're seeing the very fruit of the Jewish religious Zionist project today with the genocide and ethnic cleansing that the state of Israel is inflicting on Gaza and the West Bank. This has nothing to do with October 7th, because they're murdering Jews right now, or murdering uh, uh, Palestinians. They don't care if you're, if you're Muslim or, or Christian. You're just a Palestinian. You're not a Jew. They're murdering them on the West Bank right now, which is not connected with Hamas. See, it's ethnic cleansing and genocide, which Israel has been practicing since its beginning, in one form or another, in one wave or another. It comes in the, the Jewish version of pogroms, apparently. So uh, this will end only one way. It will end the same way it ended in 70 A.D. and 135 A.D. It's what happens when you decide to wage war against the world. The world will destroy you. So, yes, in the United States, oh, well, it's like the Ottoman Empire. It's toast. It's finished. It's gone. Its power is going to greatly diminish, uh, if not sudden, or is sudden, sudden destruction will come upon it, one or the other. Either it will well, uh, die of old age or sudden destruction. I would probably the latter, based on the Bible. Because the United States and the so-called Christendom system looks an awful lot like Babylon the Great, for a number of reasons. Western Christendom. And the United States is simply its a spot, uh, um, what should we call it, apostate or 
bastard child. Certain things about the United States, it, at times it has its moments. It could be a workable system for people to live together in peace, but that requires people to be of goodwill. And fallen humanity, by nature, is not of goodwill. That's why these projects don't work. Because human beings are not, in their fallen state, good. They're evil. You can restrain the evil to a certain degree, but they can't make them good. Only God can do that. That's why you must be born again. Only through faith in Jesus Christ. Because he brought in the new covenant where we can be forgiven of all our sins. And God works in us to create a new person in us, a new heart, a new spirit. And then he dwells in us himself. Real Christianity is always that supernatural, God created relationship between us individually and God. Because God is in us, in his people, all his people have a, a common possession in him and hence a common relationship with each other because he is in us all. And we can't hate our brothers and sisters because Christ is in them too. Not that he causes us to hate to start with. So he binds us together. Christ himself is the glue that binds real Christianity together, real Christians together. Again, Christianity is not a religious system. Constantinianism, the state Christianity, the Roman Catholicism kind of Christianity, is a religious system, not a personal relationship with God in Christ. Well, that's a long lecture on the context of the failure of the Zionist project and the ultimate failure of it, because it cannot, it cannot scratch the itch that is the fall. It cannot bring that relationship that we all must have with God, because Christ is the Savior, the mediator. He is the new covenant. He is God. So we have to be in him, or the itch will always remain, and our sinful nature will always be unrestrained. And in him, eventually, we will be perfected. That won't be a problem anymore, and that will be the day, but not that day yet. <laughs>